Whatever God touches, God redeems. No one can ever go so far down that what God's hand can't touch Amen. and redeem that lost soul. Praise God. We're going to a little known prophet this morning, Haggai. There are four books before you get to the New Testament. Haggai, chapter 2, we're going to talk about commitment and courage. Haggai, chapter 2, I'm going to read verses 1 through 9, titling the message, Commitment and Courage, beginning with verse 1. On the 21st of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shelatiah, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory. And how do you see it now? Does it not seem to you like nothing in comparison? But now take courage, Jerubbabel, declares the Lord. Take courage also, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and all you people of the land, take courage declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. As for the promise which I made you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more in a little while I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also, and the dry land. I will shake all the nations, and they will come with the wealth of all nations, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts, and in this place I will give Peace declares Amen. the Lord of hosts. You heard me tell the story of Jim Elliott who could be defined as an outstanding young man, an outstanding person who graduated from Wheaton College in 1949. He graduated with very high honors. He was a gifted speaker. He was, I think, the uh, college champion wrestler in college. And so he graduated from college and the world was open to him. As a gifted man who had promise, he had talent, he had charisma, Many doors would have opened up to him had he pursued those worldly doors, but Jim Elliott became a missionary to Ecuador in 1952. Four years later, he and four or five others were hacked to death they were slaughtered by those who they were sent to minister to. The news of his death and those four others who were with him shocked the world. Most likely the world looked upon the death of Jim Elliott as a waste. He could have accomplished much in the world. 
He could have prospered in the world. He could have succeeded in the world as defined by the world. The world would say that Jim Elliot was a foolish man who wasted his life. But Jim Elliot still answers those who would consider him a fool. One of his well-known quotes still answers his critics today. But Jim Allen is known for saying he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Amen. Jesus said, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? John, 1 John 2.17 John writes, The world and its desires pass away. But the man who does the will of God lives forever. Jim Elliot didn't throw his life away. Jim Elliot lives today. Jesus said, Seek ye the kingdom of God and His righteousness first. You see, Jim Elliot, even as a young man, considered God's business more important than the world's business. He didn't care what the world had to offer. He sought after the will of God. He sought after the kingdom of God. He sought after the righteousness of God. In other words, Jim Elliot had his priorities properly arranged. The world's a very seductive place, isn't it? The world is an extremely alluring place. It's easy to neglect. Very easy to overlook. It's very easy to not remember what's really important in life. And so, you and I have been blessed with a new year. God's given each of us this new year. He's given each of us more time. And so I would ask you this morning, as you enter into this new year, do you have your priorities in order? If not, you're a few days late, but no better time than today to get your priorities right. Amen. And so for the note takers, I want you to leave here with this. God's command to us is to be courageous and committed to the work of God. Be courageous and committed to the work of God. And the first thing I want us to see is that as Christians, we must be courageous and take a stand for God. Amen. Amen. That's right. Praise God. Be courageous. Point number one, be courageous and take a stand for God. Those of you who are Duck Daddy fans should have learned a lesson a few weeks ago. 
when Big Duck Daddy came out and made a statement and called sin, sin, the world went crazy. The world turned on him. They got angry. They began to threaten him. They began to threaten the network who sponsored the show. But Duck Daddy showed some courage. And Duck Daddy said, no, I'm not going to back down from what this book says. I believe what it says. Amen. Praise God. He wouldn't back down. They said, well, we're going to take the show away from him. He said, I don't care. And guess what? The rest of his family said, we're going with Duck Daddy. We're not staying here. Amen. 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 And then millions of Duck Daddy's followers said, if you get rid of Duck Daddy, we're going with him. It's amazing what money will do to the world, isn't it? And the world said, oh, 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 maybe we made a mistake here. Yeah. You know, you bringing us in millions of dollars, we'll, 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 we'll back off. Okay. There's a lesson there, folks. They took a stand. And they took a stand for righteousness. They took a stand for the Word of God. And they said, we're not going to back down from the devil. We're not going to back down from the world. We're not going to back down from the media. That's rare today, folks. Hallelujah. And that's where the church needs to be. Amen. But far too many churches have crawled over in the corner like a bunch of wimps whining and crying. Too many churches today have become so much like the world that it finds itself unable to take a stand. Be courageous and take a stand for God. Following God requires courage. Fifteen years prior to our text this morning, this same group of people had been forced to stop their work because of hostility. They faced the enemy's opposition. Listen, the enemy still opposed to what God is doing in this world. His position hadn't changed one bit. There were slanderous accusations made against them. We could even go back to the days of Ezra and Nehemiah when they faced opposition as well. They were threatened by death by their enemies when they were rebuilding that wall around Jerusalem. Consider the temple that Solomon built in his day. It was filled with gold. Filled with silver. It was plush. It was elaborate. It was luxurious. Quite a sight to behold was Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple was supported by millions. They didn't have any problem acquiring materials to build Solomon's temple. They didn't have any problem with laborers in building Solomon's temple. But now here, here what we have is some 50,000 Jews returning from exile. Only 50,000. Some of these 50,000 undoubtedly remembered Solomon's great temple in all of its glory. To them, this new temple that they were working on, this new temple 
that they had set out to build seemed like a shack. It was just a shanty compared to Solomon's temple and all of its wealth and all of its glory. And the foundation of this new temple had started some 16 years earlier. I did a search last night and I discovered that the United States has over 450,000 churches across the land. 450,000 churches. Some of those churches have multi-million dollar facilities. They number in size from a handful to multiple thousands. And half, half of those 450,000 churches across this land have less than 75 members. Now, small churches are often viewed and seen as insignificant. But I want to say to you this morning, no work is small when God is involved in it. Amen. That's true. No work is small when God is involved in it. You see, when we stand before God, we're going to answer for our faithfulness, not our numbers. And there's nothing wrong with numbers. But faithfulness will be what counts in eternity. And I would suggest to you this morning, as of no other time in history, in our nation has it become so needed for God's people to take a stand. Amen. That's true. Praise God. Be courageous and take a stand for God. Be courageous and be committed to God's work. Second point for the ladies taking notes. God needs those who are committed to his work. God needs those who are committed to his work. Now, in this text in Haggai, we have a small group of people who have been called to do a great work. How on earth? Could they accomplish such a challenge? Well, three times. Three times God tells them how they can accomplish this challenge. And three times God simply charges them to be strong. Folks, if you're going to serve God today, you're going to have to show some strength. Amen. You're going to have to be strong. Because you've got an enemy who's going to oppose you. You have an enemy who's going to come at you with everything he has. True, true, true. Three times God charges them to be strong. And the only way you can be strong is to be committed. I don't care what it takes. I'm going to serve God. Amen. Amen. They could, the, 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 the truth of the matter was, no matter how small they were, no matter how great the opposition may have been, 
they could accomplish their challenge because God was with them. Consider this. Jesus Christ ministered on this earth for three and a half years. When he began his ministry, he called twelve. And one of those twelve was a devil. Three and a half years later, after he had begun his ministry, Jesus Christ, after performing miracles and miracles and more miracles, the greatest signs and wonders the world has ever known, open blinded eyes, open deaf ears, raised the dead, and when it was all over with, he had very few real followers. I would suggest to you this morning that this body of believers, as small as it may be, is still a work in progress. Amen. God's here, I have no doubt about that. This church over the years has seen folks saved and baptized. That's our primary mission. As a matter of fact, I was delighted. I heard something the other day that one of the teenagers who used to attend this church was saved here. She was baptized in that baptismal tank back there now. She's now living in Texas, and she has her entire family going to church with her. Praise God. You see? This church is teaching and preaching the truth. Doesn't matter how big a church is if it's not preaching and teaching the truth. There are many of these 450,000 churches across this nation, many of them are churches in name only. They're doing nothing for God. As a matter of fact, Many of them are actually in opposition to the work of God. God needs committed Christians for any work. Whether it be a large work, whether it be a small work, God needs committed folk. With few exceptions, let me say that again, with very few exceptions, you are never going to please God unless you are a part and you are committed to a local body of believing Christians. Because that's the way God set it up. God's work proceeds from God's church. And if you're going to truly be committed to Jesus Christ, you're going to have to be committed to His bride. If you're going to be committed to Jesus Christ, you're going to have to be committed to a Bible-believing body of believers. Miss Dean and I have seen it over the years that we've served God. I can tell you this right now. The vast majority of church hoppers never grow and they never mature. That's right. If you're going to grow and you're going to mature, you're going to need some roots, folks. And those roots need water. Those roots need sunshine. Those roots need encouragement. Those roots need truth. They need nourishment in order to grow. It's 
one of the reasons for so much weakness and so much laxity and so much compromise and so much immaturity, so many underdeveloped Christians in the church today is because they're not being fed properly. They never become grounded. They never become stable because they never allow their roots to settle anywhere. You know committed people are hard to find today. Mm -hmm. I don't care what they're committed to. It's hard to find committed folk today. You know, a couple of weeks ago, Ms. Dean and I had uh, uh, one of the lines uh, drainage line stop up from our kitchen sink. The water started backing up in the sink from the washing machine. And I went out and tried to clear it up, but you know, I'm not a plumber. I did the best I could, but I couldn't get it unstopped. And so I had to get on the phone and call a plumber. I dreaded that. You know, came over and it took him about 15 minutes. Run that thing down through that pipe, run it back out. I said, what's the damage, buddy? He said, I'd be $195. He won't there 20 minutes. So I walked out to the truck with him, and he was telling about how much work he had. And he said to me, he said, you know, he said, I have a problem finding folk to work for me today. He said, even folk your age, he said, I can't find anybody dependent. Can't find anybody reliable today. And yet folk crying can't find a job. Okay. Committed people are very difficult to find today, and churches are certainly no exception. But I can tell you this. God is never going to be able to use you the way He desires to use you until you are committed to a body of believers. God needs those who are committed to His work. Be courageous and be committed.